I know uh, a lot's been happening here in Tucson, and uh, I couldn't really start even my introduction without acknowledging that our community here in Tucson, all uh, artists, uh, educators, uh, families, activists, are passionate writers and politicians have all been uh, a sane and liberal light for us here in the midst of the kinds of speech and rhetoric that seems so prevalent in the rest of Arizona. I know that we're all committed to bringing some good out of what happened here on Saturday. Part of that good is all of you being here, showing up here in the sacred place that's Casa Libre and Tucson to hear and experience these two phenomenal artists and to celebrate the specificity of language and art. At a time when words in the media are banging all over each other, jockeying for attention, competing to land on top, to have the last word in a contest of right and wrong, it behooves us as poets to listen and to excavate the cacophony. For days now, Pundits on the news have been arguing over meaning, over the responsibility language and language makers hold over actions, and vice versa. Reading Jenna Osmond teaches us to look and to disrupt that noise. She is our witness. She listens to it all, in all of its plenty, and finds a path in the news, in found texts, in cut-ups and rearrangements, in images, in her own words. She guides us, sometimes gently, sometimes with a moral reckoning into the core of thinking and the evolution of narrative, and in doing so reveals a magnificent trajectory of meaning, understanding syntax, storytelling, connections, the very neural pathways that create language. In light of what has happened here in Tucson, in this very much a peace-loving city, and for preparing this introduction, I found this paragraph at the conclusion of Osmond's article for Jacket Magazine, Is Poetry the News? It, I found it both pressing and timely. The concept of synchronous thinking, where multiple tracks of time and events are seen as simultaneous and linked, seems foundational to the poetical drive to create within the world of the poem a model for the kind of world in which one would like to live. The experimental text, as rendered by the found poem, can encourage the making of connections, lines drawn, strings strung, between an ignored or discarded past and what sits in our current and future sight lines. Jenna Osmond is the 2009 National Poetry Series winner for the, for the Network, which came out last year, published by Writers Institute partner, Fence Books. Osmond's previous books include Asterisks and The Character, winner of the Barnard New Woman Poets Prize, a PhD graduate in English and Poetics from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Osmond teaches currently in the Graduate Creative Writing Program at Temple University. Please help me welcome Jenna Osmond. Um, thank you for that introduction, and um, thank you to Casa Libra and to Lainey Brown, who initiated this connection, and all the other organizations involved in this series. Um, and I'm glad you brought that essay up. It's something I've been thinking about. This, uh, the quote that he mentioned is kind of um, summarizing Joan Vitalik's idea of poetics, where a poem, the world of a poem can somehow model the kind of world you want to live in. And in that essay, and uh, I posited this idea that, you know, the poetical thing to do is to reveal connections between things that we might not always see. And it's something that was very much in my mind as I wrote this book. But I have to say that in light of the events that happened here in the last couple of days, I'm really thinking about it. it. It almost seems kind of naive to believe in that because 
um, not all connectivity is good. <laughs> Paranoid connectivity can be really awful, and um, so I'm going to have to rethink that. But um, with that said, I'll read this after I let this person in. I actually I would love it if during my reading I keep opening the door. Okay. <laughs> That's a political thing to do. I can go out and come back in several times. If you want. Oh, let me start this. Point. I have some kind of technical. Um, this poem is from the network and it's called Mercury Rising, a Visualization. It starts with a quote from The Guide to Science written in 1868 by the Reverend Dr. Brewer. Question, why is not the air in cities so fresh as that in a country? Answer, because it is impregnated with the breath of its numerous inhabitants. 1A, there will be three parts. Pay attention to your breath. Breathe deeply, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Feel the breath in your belly and hold it, then release. When you breathe out, your breath becomes visible, a mist that you inhale through your nose and exhale from your mouth in a circle. You are surrounded by this mist and it becomes denser like a fog. Then the fog clears, and you are on the bank of a river. Listen to the sound of the wide river. Look out and see the opposite bank. There is a sandy beach and a forest beyond the sand. There is a boat with an old woman and an old man, and without a word, they take you across to the other side. As they take you, you can see stones, clear water. You can hear the water against the sides of the boat. When you get to the sandy beach, you get out of the boat, knowing that it will be there for you when you return. And you leave the boat, the man and woman, behind. 1B. There will be three parts that lead to others. Pay attention to your breath. Breathe deeply in through your nose, out through your mouth, hold it, then release. You are northwest of Las Vegas. When you breathe out, your breath is a vapor that lifts back up and you inhale it through your nose like a circle. You are 36 million miles from the sun, small and singular. Study the explosion clouds of bombs in the height of the Cold War. This place is not really a place, just housing. You are on an empty street and the light is bright and hot. No atmosphere to ward off or soften impact. You pass a movie theater, a bowling alley, both now closed. You notice that one side of the street is unbearably hot and the other side has ice in its corners. The eccentric orbit rotates three times for every two revolutions. Twenty newspaper boxes. You stop for a moment and listen to the air and it streams around the debris. Dust carried by solar wind. Hot enough to melt lead. There are voices in the distance and you walk toward them and the fluorescent lights above. A group of VIPs sit on bleachers. They watch the desert floor crater like the moon in the wake of over 900 explosions. Where the surface is fractured is called weird terrain. There are mountains, valleys, ridges, compression folds crisscross the plains. Listen to the testing. Houses collapsing under the mushroom vapor searing the skin of pigs. Tidal bulges are raised by the sun. You walk past the shattered structures and mock bridges. On your right is a clearing and you go there. In the clearing is a gun turret once used to measure the atmosphere, now inhabited by birds. You ask the bird a question and it gives you an answer. You walk back into the zone of controlled space. A large iron core provides a magnetic shield against solar storms. There will always be a use for this. You stop at a barrier where you are met by a uniformed guard. There's a gun in his holster. He looks you up and down and then lets you proceed to base camp. The streets are named Buster, Teapot, Crossroad. You walk between the empty office buildings and look up at the sky, then the horizon. You see that the light has changed 
and then a little time has passed.